I would like I would like to uh, welcome you to uh, the penultimate event of the Center for Philosophy of Science this uh, semester. Before introducing your speaker today, let me uh, announce you uh, let me give you some information about the last event of the semester, which will be taking place next week on Tuesday at noon EST. And we will be welcoming Karim Khalifa from Middlebury College, who is going to be talking about retooling the epistemology of measurements. So if you would like to uh, listen to uh, Karim talk about uh, measurement in epistemology, please join us next week on uh, Tuesday at noon for the last event of the Center for Philosophy of Science this semester. And you can register online as usual on the center's website or uh, find out its calendar and you find a link to uh, register. Today, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome again Mike Schneider, who uh, has been uh, our postdoctoral fellow at the center this semester and I've been Oh, this year, actually, I've been uh, enjoying ext uh, a lot uh, the opportunity to uh, to talk with uh, uh, Max throughout the year. Uh, despite the fact that we've been online for the whole year, uh, we've met quite a lot, and it's been really enjoyable to read his work and talk to him and get some feedback from him. Uh, Mike uh, uh, is a historian and philosopher of physics, uh, but does also uh, some work in many other areas of philosophy of science including the general philosophy of science and the social epistemology of, of science. He's actually working, we were talking about that a few minutes ago, about existential risk uh, at, at, at this time. He got his PhD last year from uh, uh, Irvine, from the LPS department at Irvine, uh, with uh, an all-star dissertation committee uh, chaired by uh, Jim uh, Weatherall. He's published widely, both in the philosophy of physics uh, on topics such as a uh, cosmological constant and also in the social epistemology of, of science. He actually has a paper called Creativity in Social Epistemology of Science Forthcoming in uh, Philosophy of, of, of Science. And he has many uh, work in progress in these um, areas, uh, scientific discovery, social epistemology of science and the philosophy of, of physics. Today, uh, Mike will be talking about empty space. Oh, and one more thing I wanted to announce before giving you the title of this talk is that uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to be able to, uh, to uh, mention that next year, Mike uh, will be uh, uh, working with uh, uh, the senior visiting fellow this uh, year at uh, the uh, center and uh, Nick Huggett. So he'll be joining uh, Nick on uh, he'll be joining Nick on his uh, project, and uh, we'll be a postdoctoral fellow with uh, Nick Huggett. And I'm really delighted to uh, to uh, to uh, be able to uh, make this. Uh, news public it might give me the authorization to do it. So in any case, um, 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 today Mike will be talking about empty space and the positive cosmological constant. Mike, uh, the floor is yours. All right, uh, thanks Laura. So uh, thanks for everyone who's come out near the end of term, I appreciate it. Um, I want to preface this talk with two apologies. First, uh, I've done a terrible thing in cobbling together slides that include no explicit citations. Obviously, the draft paper has plenty, uh, and I will make at least a couple of allusions here to some of those references. Uh, so please do ask for any leads if you're curious. My sense is that I would in other years have been uh, entirely forgiven for taking this shortcut in a lunchtime talk. But um, something about this getting live streamed and posted to YouTube in posterity makes me feel like I'm maybe committing a grave transgression. Uh, anyways, I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, the second apology is more to the content of the talk. This is a philosophy of physics project. Uh, but I think there are interesting general philosophy of science, philosophy of theory development themes which show up in a really intriguing way uh, in this context. And so I hope there's at least some material here for everyone to chew on. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let's start with a somewhat 
technical foundations of contemporary physics question that some of you might be interested in. In the wake of GR, general relativity, what is the relevant spatiotemporal background for relativistic field theories in the low energy study of matter absent the influence of gravity? Bit of a mouthful, why might you be interested in this question? Well, general relativity is a theory whose models happen to be relativistic space times. Uh, as a theory, general relativity is important for our contemporary understanding of gravity. But meanwhile, relativistic field theories seem to require some or other choice of relativistic space time as background, a target space time in which we define the relevant field in question. And so we might be interested in the interpretation of that choice of background given an embrace of general relativity in our thinking about gravity. And of course, relativistic field theories are crucial tools for how we think about the low energy study of matter. And in particular, when we engage in that study while all but ignoring uh, the influence of gravity. So here I have in mind, especially the common statement that standard model particle physics captures everything but gravity. So in fact, this exposition is uh, helpful in that it leads to a friendlier reframing of the question. In the wake of general relativity, how do we represent empty space in contemporary physics? And so here's the thought behind this reframing. Sometimes in contemporary physics, uh, we may just happen to need a means of providing salient spatiotemporal concepts in our physical investigations. Now, especially if those investigations are supposed to be ignoring the influence of gravity, we won't want a space time that in the wake of general relativity is somehow laden with gravitational considerations or full of gravitational content. So I think empty space is the right name for this sort of thing, which is standing apart from any gravitational considerations and is meanwhile the sort of thing that uh, is appropriate to supply spatiotemporal concepts in, say, our thinking about matter at low energies. And then finally, when empty space in these low energy studies of matter happens to be in need of some description in terms of space times, as for relativistic field theories, we are interested in the representation of empty space, specifically by means of space times. So I should flag this way of framing things may already be objectionable. Arguably, I've just introduced something that is new and obscure only to immediately pivot and insist that we're just going to end up representing that thing with more familiar structures. So representation is itself a kind of a messy subject. So if I'm immediately making this pivot, why don't I just start with more familiar structures, space times? So if this is broadly uh, a worry of yours, feel free to push back in the questions, but hopefully where I go with my argument in the meantime will mollify you. Uh, so for now, this here is going to be the question on the table. I'm gonna start off my argument by discussing some available answers to this question. Uh, really, I want to distinguish two answers, one coming from tradition and one new one, spurred on by the observations of a positive cosmological constant in large-scale cosmology. This is going to form the first half of my talk, and in some sense, I'm really just going to be presenting standard points. But these standard points aren't usually given the structure of an argument. And for where I want to go in the second half of my talk, the lack of any available argument filling out these standard points is uh, unsatisfactory. So I've done my best to try to reconstruct an argument that altogether acts out or reproduces the standard points in sum. And so I think I've managed to make it a plausible argument given current physics, uh, but I'm interested in and happy to try to field any objections. So uh, just to continue outlining a bit, the traditional view I have in mind fixes once and for all a mathematical convention whereby there is no fundamental cosmological constant in the governing dynamical equation at the heart of general relativity. So I'll talk about how this, con how this convention uh, shows up in our interpretations of space times and gravity. And then I'll pair this fixed convention with some other broad considerations 
which altogether may be taken as providing an explicit characterization of empty space. And on the traditional view, this characterization results in Minkowski space time as the answer to this guiding question. Uh, it's the unique way of representing empty space in the wake of general relativity uh, for the sake of field theoretic studies of matter at low energies. This understanding of Minkowski spacetime is something that is, I think, in at least some sense, equally as traditional a perspective. And this is important because really, that's my primary argumentative support for the adequacy of the explicit characterization of empty space. Namely, it winds up partaking in the cluster concept that is tradition in this broad area of fundamental physics. So I'm going to do all of that so as to then break with tradition. I'll suggest that on a less traditional perspective, there's no fixed choice of mathematical convention, except that which is set by purported measurements of the cosmological constant, however we measure it. And moreover, taking large scale cosmological observations as providing those measurements, we set the fundamental cosmological constant to be ever so slightly positive value. Taking on board this new non-traditional perspective, we're gonna break from tradition as well in our answer to this guiding question. Minkowski space time no longer, something else will come in instead as the representation of empty space. This is something that is locally uh, like another famous space time, to sitter space time, but globally it's a bit more peculiar than any one space time. In brief, I have in mind an equivalence class consisting of uh, two spacetimes, de Sitter spacetime, and its elliptic cousin, what I'll call elliptic de Sitter spacetime. So I'll talk about this equivalence class later, but the gist is that our spacetime geometry intuitions mislead us about the global structure of empty space. The canonical mathematical standard of inequivalence that's relevant for spacetime. And so relevant in the context of our general relativistic theory of gravity. Well, that standard is ill-suited in certain conversations within the physical foundations of field theories absent gravity. Now, from here on, I'll be planning to run wild, tradition be damned. I'll talk about a foundational issue in contemporary theoretical physics research given a positive cosmological constant. Um, and this is going to be the outline for what I'll say in that second half of my talk, once I run wild. First, I'll introduce what is sometimes called the elliptic interpretation of de Sitter spacetime. Uh, this is a somewhat classic way of understanding movement back and forth between uh, the two members of that equivalence class I was just introducing as jointly the representation of empty space. And the key idea here is that there is ultimately some duality or correspondence between the two space-time settings for field theories, at least insofar as those field theories are in the service of our studying the low energy physics of matter. So then I'll wanna suggest with at least one choice quote that there's a kind of freedom that is asserted by theorists who are interested in moving to elliptic to sitter space-time and away from the sitter space-time in the course of their further research. And I'm gonna to wanna to distinguish between a radical kind of freedom, characteristic of theoretical research, at least at some very high level of description. Uh, I wanna distinguish that from a more subtle kind of freedom. The radical kind fits well with an embrace of that correspondence or duality I will have just mentioned. Uh, but the more subtle kind is what I will claim is really being expressed in these sorts of projects. Finally, I'll consider this more subtle kind of freedom in the context of theory development, connecting what's going on in this case to a slightly more general framework where we're thinking pragmatically about speculation in the course of ongoing physics research. And in fact, this connects up to some other threads I've explored, uh, thinking about theoretical physicists' models of themselves as decision makers tasked with spontaneously developing future theory. So I'll allude to that, and provided that I have the time, I'll use that way of thinking to come to an audacious conclusion uh, about what I take to be the stakes surrounding the sorts of projects I have in mind within this corner of contemporary theoretical physics research. 
All right, so that was a lot of preamble, but with all of that preamble, I'm just gonna jump back to this opening framing question of interest. So to begin in earnest, I should first say more about general relativity uh, and maybe also this elocution in the wake of. So general relativity is of course a big subject, uh, but I can get away with only saying the most important bits uh, for the present. I've already mentioned that the models of this theory are relativistic space times. Really, this is just one view of the subject, which is reminiscent of model theoretic approaches to philosophy of science. In any case, the view of general relativity in terms of relativistic space times is a pretty standard one. And it fits nicely in our thinking modularly about spatiotemporal backgrounds and field theories. That is, as whole things of their own accord, which are ready to be plugged into a subsequent study of matter. And I'd love to talk more about this sense of modularity and in physical interpretation uh, if there's interest. In any case, to say again, models of general relativity are relativistic spacetimes. Uh, you can think of these formally as manifolds M paired with equivalence classes of pointwise defined metric fields that are all going to be related to one another by isometries on the manifold. And just to flag in advance of where we're going, if two spacetimes differ in their underlying manifold structure, they really are just manifestly inequivalent as spacetimes. Indeed, they're inequivalent as a matter of topological or global spacetime structure. And I've just sketched here the kinematics of general relativity. What, per the theory, is physically possible, at least if we're borrowing something kind of like a possible world semantics for use in interpreting the theory. And again, this is where the modularity point uh, sneaks in. But that's kinematics. General relativity is also a dynamical theory of gravity. There's a local dynamical equation by which smooth distributions of matter are thought to constrain the geometry of space-time, specifically in proportion to their aggregate gravitational signature, that is, some quantity of gravitational stress energy, T. Or to flip this statement right around, uh, for each model of the theory of gravity, space-time, for each relevant metric field on the underlying manifold in that model, there's an associated stress energy that one can associate with that metric field locally, point by point. And this stress energy is constructed out of the metric and its derivatives in a lossy fashion. The dynamical degrees of freedom, or sorry, the dynamical equation doesn't locally constrain all of the uh, degrees of freedom needed to specify the metric. And so what this means is that the metric, the association of a metric to stress energy is many to one. The remaining metric degrees of freedom are not direct, that are not directly constrained by the stress energy. Uh, these are sometimes called the vacuum degrees of freedom, which is terminology I'll come back to. So summarizing what I've just said, I've told you that there is a dynamical equation that locally relates uh, stress energy, T, on the underlying manifold to a geometrical structure that's fashioned out of the metric and its derivatives. But I haven't told you anything more about the form of that dynamical equation, uh, which is to say how to determine this T structure, or sorry, this T term, uh, or again, another equivalent way of saying this, I haven't told you what is that geometric structure, which is defined by the metric in this particular lossy fashion that I've alluded to. And in fact, the structure is one member of a whole family of structures, which are associated with any given metric. And these are sometimes called the Einstein tensors. We can think of this family as canonically equivalent to a family of candidate dynamical equations for general relativity, the family of Einstein equations with variable cosmological constant. This family has the structure of the additive heap on the reals. So any indexing of the family by the reals which represents or respects the family's heap structure. Uh, that indexing can also be understood to endow the family with a privileged member, that which is indexed to zero. So which is the privileged member uh, is set as a matter of convention in terms of the explicit choice of indexing. 
And you can think of this in terms of a pullback defined by the index function, where the index set is itself conceived as the additive group on the reals, with zero the standard identity element there. So we have a theory of space-time geometry wherein gravity is understood as a coupling of a part of that geometric structure, whichever metric representation we use of it, to an associated representation of the gravitating stress energy of matter. But meanwhile, the nature of that coupling is underspecified, except by mathematical convention. So hopefully that's enough theoretical background. Uh, people who are used to these sorts of spiels about general relativity may note that I've phrased everything a tiny bit idiosyncratically. But there's a reason for the idiosyncrasies uh, for the purposes of this talk. They'll help with where I plan to go now that we're back to this framing question. In the wake of general relativity, now that we have this understanding of gravity in terms of the features of space-time geometry, how do we represent empty space wherever we should need to do so? So first, I think it's clear that empty space is going to be represented by a vacuum spacetime. Or to put the point slightly differently, a spacetime geometry associated with empty space should be a geometry that is associated with no gravitating stress energy. Think t equals zero. This is what things would look like in nature, so to speak, if we simply flipped the gravitational interaction off. What counts as a vacuum spacetime isn't going to be defined until after the mathematical, mathematical convention, which selects out one dynamical equation from the whole family of Einstein equations. But once we have that choice of equation, this notion of vacuum is completely natural. It's what satisfies the source-free version of the equation. Any spacetime satisfying this version of the chosen equation differs from any other only in terms of their underlying manifold structure or else in terms of their vacuum degrees of freedom if we take as given some fixed manifold. But really, I think we have in mind a much more narrow conception of the spacetime geometry of empty space. In particular, when we study isolated systems, or when we study the behaviors of fields without thinking there's anything interesting to say about gravity. We typically aren't thinking about most vacuum spacetimes, full of gravitational waves and so on. Moreover, we typically aren't thinking about, we aren't thinking about most of the underlying manifolds that admit vacuum models. So one sometimes sees old discussions about the algebraic properties of phenomenal free space. Uh, that is to say, the structure of whole classes of geometric transformations that send the geometric features of phenomenal space back into themselves. I think something along those lines is typically in our minds when we think about empty space as well. In particular, we think of empty space as being maximally symmetric. And I don't just mean locally maximally symmetric. Locally maximally symmetric would be a property of the class of metrics that's associated with a given spacetime, which might just as well feature any underlying manifold. By contrast, I mean there's nothing funky about space and time in any direction we might look through the manifold and from anywhere we might be. Or, and this is just the same, I promise, at least for spacetimes, I claim that empty space is represented by vacuum spacetimes that are isotropic. Maximal symmetry and isotropy are both algebraic notions. They have to do with the implicit algebraic structure of the whole collection of isometric metric fields distinguished by the space-time model. Philosophers of physics in the audience, though, should hopefully be pretty familiar with the interplay between algebraic and geometric concepts in space-time theories. And this interplay is what's witnessed by the common employee of mathematical machinery that is algebraic geometry, uh, and specifically as flourished in the middle of the 1900s in the study of general relativity. In any case, what does isotropy get us? Here's hopefully an intuitive physics definition. Take the light cone structure that's associated with the tangent space at any point in the spacetime. 
without too much cost, you can think of this structure in terms of whole families of oriented frames defined in that tangent space, centered on that point. And each of these families has the algebraic structure of the Lorentz group. This is the structure that gets you the constancy of the speed of light in special relativity. The constancy, I should say, of the operational speed of light in special relativity about a given event. And this, as a result, is what determines the local wavefront propagation of fields. And so roughly, this is what locally makes relativistic field theories relativistic on a given manifold, rather than anything else. So that's the light cone structure. Isotropy of a spacetime implies that this light cone structure, which we can define at any given point in the spacetime, it faithfully extends onto the whole spacetime. So if a spacetime is isotropic, then the inertial structure of the spacetime is an, in an important sense a faithful representation of the light cone structure we might as well have defined in the tangent plates at any point within the manifold. So the idea here is that empty space, unlike most vacuum geometries, replicates local light cone structure globally. And it does so from everywhere. Okay, so I've moved quickly in that reasoning. I've basically asked you to go out on a limb in accepting this uh, space-time characterization of empty space. But in a moment, I hope you'll be totally on board with it. And here's why. Let's now uh, together derive some satisfaction with the present proposal by settling comfortably into a familiar tradition in physics. This tradition, or this traditional view, uh, it holds that the privileged equation in the family of Einstein equations discussed earlier is the equation that can be written as what we typically call Einstein's equation with zero cosmological constant. So it may actually be a stretch to call this the traditional view, as there's a long history of the cosmological constant being possibly present in relativistic physics. But I think discussions of a non-zero cosmological constant are usually framed against a presumption that, except where we might have cause to introduce a cosmological constant, there simply is no such constant. That is, it isn't merely set to zero, but antecedently fixed there. So I could give a more precise argument uh, about why this ought to be seen as, what, or why this ought to be what is seen as tradition. Feel free to ask me about it. I don't actually think I'll get too much resistance in this talk to just labeling it as tradition. Because it all comes together very nicely with the present proposed characterization of empty space. Here's what I have in mind. Traditionally, Minkowski spacetime, the spacetime of special relativity, is the default kinematic structure called upon to entertain relativistic concepts in field theories. Meanwhile, Minkowski spacetime winds up as the unique isotropic vacuum spacetime uh, on what I'm here calling the traditional view, which sneaks into our definition of vacuum. Hence, Minkowski spacetime is on the traditional view, the unique spacetime representation of empty space, given my proposed characterization. Nice cluster concept of tradition. And that's just the point. Really, while you could think of this characterization I've given of empty space as an explicit definition, and that is kind of how I presented it in isolation, I prefer to think of it, it as just one part of uh, that whole cluster concept of tradition within relativistic physics. Nonetheless, uh, it's helpful to isolate this one part of tradition, uh, specifically for when it comes to pass that we want to start breaking from tradition broadly and tracking the cracks that propagate. So the large scale cosmological measurements of a non-zero cosmological constant parameter in lambda CDM standard model cosmology uh, in the 1990s, this led to one such break with tradition, at least in certain communities. Certain theoretical physicists have taken the success of lambda CDM to imply a precision measurement of a fundamental cosmological constant whose value 
is given in appropriate units by the parameter value of lambda in lambda CDN. And this is so whether the value, the parameter value in lambda CDN is zero or any other. This fundamental constant is then appealed to as just cause for fixing anew the mathematical convention in the background of general relativity, distinguishing with respect to a uh, system of units, a new privileged member of the family. And that's gonna be the equation that can be written as Einstein's equation with cosmological constants set at a fixed value equivalent to the parameter relevant in large scale cosmological model. And I'll note in passing that it's only subsequent to this picture of the physical cause for fixing the mathematical convention that the traditional view uh, winds up being measure zero by any empirically reasonable choice of measure. So uh, I'm not gonna be too picky about the particular value we give the cosmological constant. More important is the sign. Since the cosmological constant happens to be positive, vacuum uh, solutions have positive uh, curvature rather than zero curvature in the traditional view. And again, the zero curvature option is now from this new perspective of how we uh, set the constant, it's measure zero on this new view. Of particular importance, having broken with tradition in this way, there's no longer a unique isotropic vacuum space time. Empty space by the earlier characterization is represented by the equivalence class consisting of two space times with different underlying manifold structures, respectively. So let's uh, talk about the two members of this equivalence class. These two space times are de Sitter space time and it's elliptic cousin, what I'll call elliptic de Sitter space time. And I sometimes, maybe often, will slip and refer to DS and EDS instead of their full names. So now, de Sitter space time is nearly as familiar as Minkowski space time. It's the constant positive curvature spacetime that stands to Minkowski spacetime as a sphere stands to a plane. In fact, if we restrict ourselves to a uh, space-like force sphere in five-dimensional Minkowski spacetime, the embedded hypersurface of just one fewer dimension with its inherited metric just is de Sitter spacetime. So here's that, what I just said in picture form. Uh, two spatial dimensions are suppressed. Uh, and here the vertical Z axis is a time coordinate in the sort of higher dimensional ambient space. Thinking of de Sitter space time in this way as a hyperboloid in a higher dimensional space, it's clear that the space time is going to be time orientable with conformal infinity in two components, past and future infinity, bottom and top of the compactified hyperboloid. Now, each of these components uh, at infinity are space-like with equivalent asymptotic symmetry groups. And so the Penrose diagram basically looks like a square with vertical edges identified in an orientation preserving manner. And I should say I've grabbed these figures from Gordon Bell. So if we consider an arbitrary maximal inertial observer in de Sitter spacetime, what we find is that their causal past and causal future, respectively, are bounded by future and past cosmological horizons. Here, just the future horizon is drawn, but it's easy enough to imagine the past horizon as well. Just rotate the white triangle 180 degrees uh, around the center point of the diagram. Okay, so that was in a rush to sit or space time. There's obviously a lot more we could say about its structure, but I don't think we'll need too much more for this talk. On to elliptic de Sitter spacetime, de Sitter spacetime's slightly more mysterious cousin. So it's harder to visualize. So this is probably somewhat of an unhelpful slide. Um, I said that de Sitter spacetime is to Minkowski spacetime like a sphere is to a plane. Well, EDS is to DS like elliptic space is to a sphere. That's why it goes by the name elliptic to sitter spacetime. You can construct elliptic to sitter spacetime explicitly by identifying antipodes into sitter spacetime um, when we construe it as a hyperboloid 
in the higher dimensional ambient space. Uh, so in this diagram from before of De Sitter space-time as such an embedded hyperboloid, the antipode of a point x, y, z is negative x, negative y, negative z. But this is, of course, a coordinate-specific characterization, and there are going to be others as well. In any case, hopefully it's easy to see that De Sitter space-time is going to be the uh, time-orientable double cover and universal cover of elliptic De Sitter space-time. Now, alternatively, you can think of elliptic De Sitter space-time as the interior space-time when past and future conformal infinity in DS are identified with an inverted twist. So uh, in the Penrose diagram from before, imagine identifying the horizontal edges uh, where the bottom right corner is brought up to the top left corner and the bottom left corner is brought up around to the top right corner. And as my convoluted hand gestures may imply, this is at the cost of flipping the time orientation in the process. Uh, so this is a somewhat coordinate specific um, construction. Another one uh, is as follows. You can think of elliptic to sitter space time as comprising exactly the upper half of this original conformal diagram. Um, I mentioned this alternative, further alternative Penrose diagram characterization, just to stress that there's a pretty natural sense in which elliptic to sitter space time can be understood as comprising exactly half of De Sitter space-time. Okay, so again, pretty equally rushed, that's elliptic De Sitter space-time. Uh, per my remarks about identifying past and future conformal infinity with the twist, uh, elliptic De Sitter space-time's conformal boundary clearly exists in only one component rather than two. And this is an attractive, comparatively attractive feature of the space-time compared to De Sitter. Uh, in the context of quantum gravity and quantum cosmology. Um, and this is for various reasons I won't actually need to go into, but that's the background research context uh, for the second half of the talk. Okay, so the space-time EDS is manifestly not time-orientable, uh, though that turns out to be less of a problem for defining field theories than you might have expected. Um, but there are, of course, subtleties and complications to that. Sentiment. All right, so take them together. Maybe what I'm about to say already comes across in how I've presented the two space times. De Sitter space time and its elliptic cousin are similar to each other in a very, very strong sense. The difference between them is, in effect, merely a difference of global underlying manifold structure. Of course, that difference is substantive in our thinking about space-time geometries. So merely a global difference shouldn't be dismissed lightly. And I should say that anecdotally, this is often dismissed or it has to me often been dismissed without apology. And that's fine. Part of this project is just to establish the counter argument so that dismissing it requires some apology. So, in that spirit, that empty space be represented in the wake of general relativity by an equivalence class of two globally different space-time geometries. I think this highlights how empty space in contemporary physics really is a different subject than its representation by space-times. In particular, given the new view on the cosmological constant, empty space's geometric property of being vacuum together with its algebraic property of being isotropic, is insufficient to mandate that empty space be uniquely represented by a single space-time, that is, by a single model of general relativity. Instead, it's the sort of structure whose role in contemporary physics risks being mischaracterized without proper care, wherever there's a need to represent it by just one or another space-time. And of course, this is precisely the situation in relativistic field theories. So with all that in mind, I can commence with the rest of my talk. The essential issue on the table is this. If empty space is not uniquely represented by a single space-time, given a positive cosmological constant in general relativity, then what does that mean for our field theoretic understanding of matter at low energies absent gravity? 
After all, our use of field theoretic concepts to study matter in these settings is typically understood to require some or other space-time geometry in the background. And different backgrounds show up as different physics when we turn to consider the models of the resultant field theory defined on each. So uh, I'm happy to talk more in the questions period about the sense in which to sitter space-time and elliptic to sitter space-time amount to different or the same settings in well-understood field theories of low energy matter. Uh, for now, just I'd like you to take it for granted that these really are different backgrounds for field theories with different consequences in our thinking about field theoretic physics. And importantly, again, they're different in virtue of merely differing globally. So in light of this mere difference, here's one, uh, I think, choice quote that captures a certain phenomenon in theoretical physics practice, specifically in the context of research in the vicinity of quantum gravity and quantum cosmology. The quote is thus, hence we are using our freedom of topology to impose an antipodal identification of the sitter space. That is, the physicists are asserting a freedom to switch between two distinct space-time structures in virtue of the two relevant space-times differing merely globally, or that is topologically, differing just in terms of their underlying manifold structure. Antipodal identifications are what allow for movement from de Sitter space-time to elliptic de Sitter space-time. Covering constructions are going to be what allow for movement back in the other direction. For some context, these quotes typically come near the beginnings of projects exploring how the features of just elliptic to sitter spacetime, uh, how they could be relevant in our thinking about the relationship between quantum theories of matter and future theories of quantum gravity. I don't want to go into detail on that point. Uh, I just wanted to flag that these projects are comfortably within the uh, frontiers of quantum gravity research, maybe even the dubious uh, frontiers. They include proposals for a cosmological horizon complementarity principle, um, although that's usually couched in membrane language, which is closer to the language used to discuss black holes. As I said, I'm really interested in the kind of freedom that is being asserted in this move to take advantage of elliptic to sitter space-time in the course of quantum gravity research. I think the standard gloss is to treat this freedom as reflecting a particular kind of physical claim. This is the claim that there exists a correspondence or a duality in the low energy studies of matter absent gravity between field theories that are located on each of the two space times respectively. So this is what I'm writing as DS slash EDS, that is a proposed de Sitter elliptic de Sitter correspondence. A couple of things to note, first, I'm going to just use the word correspondence from now on. I'm going to drop the term duality. Uh, duality has a rather more specific use, which is typically in string theory. And in dropping this term, this may ultimately be me giving up a richer understanding of a purported DS-EDS duality, say within string theory. Uh, and I'm happy to say more about that. Uh, here, I'm trying to be more general. Second item of note, Field theories on each of de Sitter and elliptic de Sitter space-time are again, they're distinct from each other. And I mean this both in regards to classical field theories and quantum field theories. The proposed correspondence says that these differences are somehow not physically significant in the low energy study of matter absent gravity. I have in mind here the sort of uh, philosophical discussion one typically sees with regards to gauge theories where there's some further theory which ultimately recognize, recognizes what was so far regarded as physically rich structure, uh, now is regarded rather as physically besides the point. So it's in fact surplus to the physical content of the theory now properly clarified, or it's redundant, et cetera. Here, sort of by analogy, the idea is that it is an artifact of our using relativistic field theories uh, to pursue the low energy study of matter, absent gravity, uh, which is misleading us into interpreting the specific choice of spatiotemporal background and its narrow consequences as physically pertinent. 
So if there is such a correspondence, then we might just as well help ourselves to one setting as the other. Exactly analogous to how one is free to help themselves to a choice of gauge, if it's convenient. So if DS EDS, then we get a matter theoretic justification for what Schrodinger in the 1950s originally called the elliptic interpretation of de Sitter spacetime. The move from thinking of physics in de Sitter spacetime in terms of de Sitter spacetime to thinking of that same physics in terms of de Sitter spacetime's elliptic cousin. So if the elliptic interpretation of de Sitter spacetime is what is being appealed to in the assertion of freedom quoted earlier, then I think it is safe to say that the freedom being asserted is a radical kind, one of radical reinterpretation of one formal structure relevant in physics, simply stipulating that it be understood rather in terms of another. This could be what's going on. In the theorist's own remarks, one typically finds operationalist arguments. These are claims about a putative observational indistinguishability uh, between the two spacetimes. And I think those claims can be read in this spirit. And in some respect, this sort of radical freedom is surely going to be descriptive of theoretical inquiry at some high level, where one is free to entertain just about anything, only incurring costs such as recovering previous successes in physics, once things start to look promising down the road. But deep in the details, I don't actually think it is this broad radical freedom of reinterpretation that's being asserted at least in the present case. In other words, I don't think the freedom being asserted is the elliptic interpretation of de Sitter spacetime. I think what is being asserted is that the physicists are free to move to elliptic de Sitter spacetime. That is, they're free to break the indeterminacy in current physics between the two representations in favor of just one. And meanwhile, they happen to be exercising that freedom by breaking the indeterminacy in favor of this one choice of representation, elliptic to sitter space time, rather than the other. So this is a much more controlled kind of freedom, which is relevant at a more fine-grained level of description of their activity of theoretical research. The thought is that they are moving uh, beyond what we can get from current physics, which after all only supports the equivalence class consisting of the two space times. In other words, having consulted with our current physics to the best of its means of distinguishing relevant formal structures for appropriate use in physical theorizing, we wind up in this particular application with no further means of selecting either one of de Sitter spacetime or its elliptic cousin over the other. And it's at this point that the freedom is being asserted that we can nonetheless take a next step and simply pick one postponing justification for that choice of which spacetime we picked over the other until that decision would turn out to have been productive. But now motion was just a bit of a filler word. This controlled freedom evidently has to do with the theoretical physicists readily outstripping their own evidence base. And this should key us into the fact that what we have in our hands here is something to do with the subject of speculation in science. So in the context of speculation, pragmatic considerations take over. Elliptic de Sitter spacetime is chosen, say, rather than de Sitter spacetime, for some immediate fruits won in the course of theoretical research. But this is all given that there aren't reasons supplied by our current physics to do any such thing. Note that this is the freedom of a decision maker to decide in the face of ongoing uncertainty. It is not the freedom of an epistemic agent to swap out whatever is their implicit metaphysics or their interpretation of the physics around which they organize and make sense of their beliefs in accordance with their current total evidence. So elsewhere, I've suggested that certain present attitudes toward details of future physics have the status of anticipations. That is, one adopts a doxastic attitude whereby they think that certain details simply must be borne out by future theory for certain current bets about that future theory still in development to be reasonable to make right now. The suggestion is that we should think of a kind of projection of one's current epistemic self into the context of the future theory, even if we're not yet able to articulate what that theory is. And so we content ourselves with merely anticipating bits of it. The upshot of doing this is easy enough to see, or 
Rather, it's easy to see the upshot of this perspective on what a theorist indeed does when they're contemplating the future theory they're presently still trying to develop. When these theorists commit to the relevant sorts of bets, they simultaneously regard the subsequent anticipations about the future theory as settled terrain. So they find themselves with particular obligations, work that must be done so that the eventual theory is ensured to bear out those details. And that is just what is needed to make just their having committed to the bets today. So that was a bit rushed. Uh, in these last few minutes, all I'm trying to do is connect up a few threads. As I mentioned when last on this slide, uh, speculations are moves justified on their immediate fruits, having outstripped current epistemic justification given current physics. On the perspective I was just summarizing, the kinds of bets that foster anticipations for theorists, well, those count as speculations. Anticipations are what the researchers presently think are downstream consequences of their following through on those speculations. And the upshot is that our assessments of the immediate fruits of those speculations, these bets, well, they get cashed out in terms of our consulting, what are the anticipations that would come from our taking on those bets and proceeding with those particular speculations. So I'm moving quickly, I'm low on time, but here's the big takeaway. This present case witnesses one instance where theorists may assess what anticipations would come of which speculative bets. And those assessments are what then can ultimately function as the argumentative grounds for those same physicists' decisions in the course of their research. So in particular, in this case, the physicists are asserting that they're free to bet that elliptic to sitter spacetime will turn out in retrospect the relevant choice of representation of empty space in their ongoing studies. But ambitiously, I can say a tiny bit more on this final slide, which connects up one further thread. I claim that the relevant anticipation in the case of betting on elliptic to sitter spacetime is the following. In the recovery of our current field theories of matter at low energies and absent gravity from a future theory of matter that's compatible with quantum gravity, there will crystallize a justification for elliptic to sitter spacetime rather than to sitter spacetime as the relevant spacetime setting for field theories. In other words, the anticipation is one about an eventual interthoretic explanation of the structure of empty space in our current field theoretic study of matter at low energies and absent gravity. I have in mind an explanation in just the same sense as uh, Jim Weatherall, my old advisor, once argued that the Newtonian equivalents of gravitational and inertial mass are explained in the course of the Newtonian theory's recovery from general relativity. And note that in his case, the explanandum happened to be an empirical fact framed in the language of the old theory. Here, the explanandum is not an empirical fact, at least not so in any straightforward way. Still, nonetheless, it's something that in retrospect will be explained, or at least that's what is presently being anticipated when the physicists assert that they are in their freedom as theorists, betting in favor of elliptic to sitter space. All right, uh, hopefully I didn't lose all of you in my rushing at the end of the talk but thanks for listening. All right, thank you very much for this great lecture. Let me remind you how we're going to be proceeding. If you have a question, please go to the bottom of your screen, click on the Q&A button, just write your name and I will promote you to the studies of panelists and you can join uh, Mike uh, and ask him the question directly. And it takes me a few minutes to do that, so please bear with me. Right. Mike, could you exit from the sharing screen option? All right, thanks. Niels, the floor is yours. Ah, hi, uh, thanks a lot for that, Mike. That was really interesting. Um, I just have a very basic uh, question and I go back and forth between thinking it's just a matter of trivial terminology or thinking that there's more to it. So I apologize if it's the former. 
Um, but at the, at the very start, you talk about empty space time, right? And I take it that by that you mean space time devoid of matter. Of course, lambda is there. So I take it you're committed to calling lambda not matter. But at the same time, we associate energy with matter. And often, energy is taken to be a sufficient criterion for something being matter. So I guess I was wondering whether you would comment on that or whether you think that proper actual matter has some properties that lambda uh, misses, or whether this is just terminology and it doesn't really actually matter for what you're trying to say. Right. So I think often it is uh, just terminology, but not always. And so here, here I do mean something slightly more uh, specific, so I can't dismiss the question by just saying uh, it's terminology. Uh, I think it's important to distinguish what it would mean to mimic dynamically the effects of a cosmological constant and to uh, assert that and nonetheless we can talk about whether or not there is a sometimes fundamental or sometimes bare cosmological constant. And you can understand this as, so on the traditional view, it's just sort of fixed from the start that there is none. So if you ever have need to introduce one, you're merely dynamically mimicking its effects. Um, on the, what I called an alternative or new view, breaking from tradition, we just take um, empirical measurements of various forms, for instance, large scale cosmology, to be a way of setting the convention. That language though is where this is more than just terminological. What it means is you're, you're interpreting what is meant by fundamental cosmological constant as a feature of the equation that characterizes uh, which models, which space times are vacuum and which aren't. Of course, you can always dynamically mimic uh, the effects of one choice with another central governing equation, which picks out different models as vacuum, but now you have this mysterious energy density that you need to explain. And so that's why many of the disputes do reduce, I think, to terminology. But uh, if we're tracking what's meant by vacuum, we need to mean something slightly more careful. Thanks. Thanks, Nils, for, for joining us. David, uh, you're next. Thank you. Um, I, I have a sort of deflationary worry about this, um, but I'm not sure how decisive it is, but it, it goes something like this. When we use the standard model, when we use non-gravitational QFT in general, we're not using it to do cosmology. We're using it to model quite small systems. Um, and my former colleague, um, Porter Williams, is fond of remarking that the, um, you know, we, we, we do scattering experiments to see what happens at infinity, but the um, LHC tube is three meters across. Um, now, from that perspective, it's at least tempting to want to say, okay, fine, um, the boundary conditions at infinity are unphysical anyway, do what you like with them. Um, if it's convenient, and the cosmological constant is negligible in its dynamical effects and the, the, the scales of particle physics, do what you like with it. So if you want, if it's convenient to set the physics to, um, uh, to Minkill Minkowski background, go for it. If it's convenient to set the physics to a de Sitter or elliptic de Sitter background, go for it. Come to that, as is, you sometimes find in literature, it's convenient to set the background just to be um, a locally Minkowski metric on a torus, go for it. Um, uh, any, insofar as there are any differences there, they should, they're unphysical anyway, because none of those things capture the actual boundary conditions. The actual boundary conditions are given by the walls of the LHC. Right. So, uh... Right, so he, here's, here's my way of dressing up what is the deflationary line that I take it you're saying. Um, look, even I can help myself to the sort of beyond just terminological distinctions that I was just sort of addressing with Niels. I can say that um, as long as we're you know, in the right sort of regimes, uh, it will always be the case that any uh, any field theory on de Sitter is well approximated you know, sufficiently locally in the right regimes by a field theory on Minkowski, which is likewise going to be well approximated by any sort of other. Um, and because this follows from the fact that typically in particle physics, we are only interested in the local dynamical content of these theories. Yeah. Um, and slightly more than just we're not interested. We've got no reason to feel the theory has adequate modeling capacity um, regarding global details. Right. So uh, if it is the case that all we care about um, in 
our understanding of gravity is what we can split off as the local content of the theory of general relativity, which in this context is uh, taken fairly for granted and for good reasons. Uh, then I think the deflationary line can get some steam going. The pushback, even granting that, I think is when you start to see projects about whether you can um, do all of de Sitter cosmology in a cosmological patch. And this, I mean, so Sean Carroll's fond of sort of exploring a line where you could maybe completely justify a finite Hilbert space quantum cosmology um, if, if the sort of, sort of antecedent lines are all in place that get you to thinking about De Sitter rather than Minkowski, rather than, well, I guess a Taurus would probably give you a finite, but. Um, so the first, the first defense against the deflation is that there are contexts in these areas of research where uh, it is helpful to track the sort of global content of general relativity above and beyond local content. The other uh, thing worth mentioning is I think this sort of subtlety matters for um, how we can model potential breakdowns of the assumption that local degrees of freedom are all that are important to our understanding of gravity. Um, and so these conversations about what it means to flip gravity off, carrying global sort of presuppositions is I think worth bringing to the surface. Okay, so that that makes that's helpful. That, that makes me realise I've slightly misinterpreted something you're doing here. So I was thinking in terms of, you know, the relevance of our theory of empty space to our understanding of our matter theories was relevant to things like standard model physics. But you want to be, um, you're you're, talk, you're talking about cosmology. You're talking about you know whole universe physics. But then I'm then I'm missing something because then it seems that the the empty space, I mean, I can see the role that the empty space idealization is doing in our local non gravitational physics. I'm struggling rather hard to get my grip on what the work the empty space idealization is doing in cosmology, where it just empirically the space is not, not, not empty on the average. Um, good. So I, I may not have a, a fully adequate answer here because uh, a lot of my entry into this project was uh, again trying to dress up the argument against which somebody who wants to sort of pull this deflationary line uh, and dismiss it like try I'm trying to just build up the argument that you could then come in and argue against that a deflationary view uh, and so maybe deflation is the ultimate end of this sort of dialectic. Um, so I'm, I'm open to that being the outcome, in which case there wouldn't be a satisfactory answer. Uh, nonetheless, one preliminary thought is that um, one thing we're trying to get a grip on in sort of mathematical physics approaches to field theories is what is the physics being captured versus what is the, um, what are what I call the narrow consequences of using field theories to sort of study that physics. And this should be especially um, comforting or exciting to someone steeped in this view of standard model where the low energy story we were always going to tell was in some sense uh, artifactual. So if you have this view of the low energy physics where you, you are happy to regard the sort of means of approaching the low energy regime by means of particular formalisms, then it seems especially prudent to track which is the formalism doing the work and which is the physics. And so I think that stands even without an explicit uh, response to you about what is the way of thinking about cosmology that ever makes empty space relevant, except maybe some sort of asymptotic to the future when we can forget about cosmic structure or something. Okay, I need to think about that, thank you. Thanks, David. Chris, floor is yours. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, so this might just be a friendly thing. So, I mean, there are some extravagant sort of alternative theoretical cosmological models that posit a kind of background mother space time from which you get like fluctuating baby space times. And it's important to some of these models that the background space time be a kind of empty space time devoid of matter like a day sitter space time. So this is a picture you get, for example, in the Carol Chin model published in 2004. And then of course, Carol modified it and updated it in 2010 in some subsequent publications. Um, and this is to some extent related to the initial question about what we mean by empty space time, right? Like uh, what we mean by matter. Um, and it, it's true of day sitter space time that, that actually there are particles, there's thermodynamic phenomena. The famous Hawking Gibbons paper of 1977 famously explores the thermodynamic properties of empty day sitter space time. Um, so th there is something really interesting going on with the terminology. Um, with regard to you know, what matter is and you know, um, when, we, when we describe a space-time as being empty. Um, anyways, that, this isn't related to my question. So my question is, I, I was a little bit confused about something you said earlier. <clears throat> um, it sounded like, and again, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, this is just a clarification question, but it sounded like you were saying something like the cosmological constants is, is, is a kind of convention it's kind of artificial, but then you said something like, well, there are these justifications of value judgments about the cosmological constant and that these are motivated by particular measurements. But then I was sort of, the question that rose was, you know, why or what are the relevant justification providing measurements uh, measuring if the cosmological constant is in some sense conventional. And I, I thought that one of the most powerful reasons for positing a positive cosmological constant was that such a mathematical truth is interpreted as the presence of real dark vacuum energy and that such energy is sort of required to explain the experimentally detected accelerated expansion. So I, I must be misunderstanding. So, so I just wanted to get clarification. Right, so distinguish the sort of philosophical groundwork I'm doing from the lines that we might want to, or what, what a physicist might want to give. Uh, so my leaning on the language of sort of a mathematical convention was to stress that there's a point of entry into a discussion about the cosmological constant, where that happens sort of very conceptually early on. It's there, there are maybe plenty of good arguments that don't distinguish which equation in this family that has the structure of a heap, which is just a group that's forgotten what is the identity element. Um, and then at this stage, sort of the, the traditional view or the thing that partakes in the cluster concept that is tradition is, well, we want Minkowski space time to be vacuum. And the only one that that's the only time that's going to be true is if we take the equation from this family that, uh, has a zero, has no fundamental cosmological constant. Uh, so that was the traditional view, but then there's a different attitude and maybe this is equally traditional because it has been around for the entire duration of relativity, but it, in some sense it's less traditional because it breaks from special relativity. Um, that's the view that, well, we're gonna look to empirical methods as a means of securing physical grounds for which equation we pick. Um, and it's in this tradition that looks at the parameter lambda in lambda CDM and interprets that as further, not just a parameter in large scale cosmological modeling, but it interprets that as in fact, a precision measurement of the constant that we expect to appear in this fundamental uh, equation and its understanding of gravity. I shouldn't say fundamental equation because it's classical gravity. But, um, okay, so with all of that set up, you then turn around and say, well, to, to what extent are we making this inference because we need to, we take standard model cosmology to be giving us access to some form of energy versus anything else. Um, I think at that point from, from the, the setup that I've given, that would be a non-starter. 
the thing that you are inferring is uh, not that there exists some energy, but you're you're just you're just you're just grounds to pick which equation you want to use for our understanding of gravity. Does that? Yeah, I, I think you know, I, I just I really fill it in. Confused. Yeah, I. Yeah, I strongly disagree with that. Um, yeah, you and I should talk about this. Um, here's here's another way. Here, here's another very quick intuitive physics argument. Take your favorite version of a cosmic no hair theorem that gets you that we're approaching sort of in, in cosmic time goes to infinity, we're approaching to sitter metric. Um, you can simultaneously understand the inference to lambda and lambda CDM as we needed a means of slowing down the structured growth. And so one way of viewing the cosmic no hair theorems is that eventually the thing that is slowing down cosmic growth overwhelms and uh, leads to there being sort of undergrowth and then eventually nothing. And so the future state of, st of standard model lambda CDM cosmology is the state in which in a given sort of characteristic volume, there is no cosmic structure. And that seems like a perfectly good operational but, but, uh, picture of a vacuum. But, but Mike, look, but Mike, look, so you, you have theorems like the, the ehlers guerin socks theorem, right? Which tell us that if you make particular kinds of measurements, okay, um, and, and there, are, there are, of course, much more attenuated versions of this theorem where the antecedent of the theorem isn't as robust. But you have these, you know, the EGS-like theorems, a family of theorems, which say that if you make particular kinds of measurements on the cosmic microwave background radiation, um, and of, of the kind that we have, of the kind that we, we, we we're in possession of records of this kind, measurements of this kind, which approximate what you need, to get the antecedents of these theorems. And, and, then, and then the consequent of this, these, these theorems says that your universe is gonna be Friedman, Lamachi, Robertson, Walker. But as, but as soon as you get an FLRW uh, cosmology, right? You, you're, you've constrained your equation choices, right? And now um, on those kinds of models, right? Uh, an accelerated expansion of the universe is gonna be driven by something issuing forth from dynamical effects of a non-zero cosmological constant. So I, I'm not seeing how in anywhere in that line of reasoning, there is arbitrariness, room for convention. It's a matter of what equations you choose. It's all constrained by the empirical deliverances of the, cosm of the astronomy and, and astrophysics. Um, I mean, so, so there are a few places where I'd sort of caution the inferences you made, but I don't think any of them matter. I, I can happily grant everything you said, the room for uh, convention as, as we're putting it is in whether the uh, inference to a parameter called lambda in the FLRW uh, cosmology, which captures the evolution and growth of structure at sort of cosmologically relevant scales is that parameter uh, sourced by uh, something that will entail sort of obligations in our theory of matter? Or is it a feature of the dynamics of gravity that given much more conventional sources? we would expect to see that sort of acceleration just due to gravity in the application of the FLRW equation, the, the Friedman equations to large scale cosmology. Yeah, I, I, I'm uh, not yeah. understanding that response. Okay, all right. Uh, I will use my power to uh, stop this exchange here. Um, um, I invite you to uh, keep going by email. Uh, Nick, you're next. Hi there. Yeah, thanks for this not really nice talk. Um, I mean, actually, the questions I had were, were kind of addressed ones Nielsen and, and David asked. Um, 
but I had another bit sort of in the background, um, which I guess conveniently also lets me fall back on your invitation to ask about the sources that uh, in question time. And so you, you kind of use that question because I, I feel that'll help me sort of understand a little bit your responses to them. Could you, so I take it, you know, amongst those citations, you know, about, amongst the missing citations are people who are actually making a, the assumption of elliptic um, de Sitter space um, to do some quantum field theory work. And I think, you know, that'll help, un, I guess, address sort of seeing what they're actually doing with this, I think would help address David's question, but it also helped me understand, I think also maybe what you've been talking with Chris as well about the status of the, you know, what they're thinking the status of the, the um, cosmological constant is. So yeah, what, what physics are they trying to do? And perhaps, you know, what quantum gravity theory do they have in the back of their mind as, you know, that they think they're doing in a low energy limit if, if that's relevant? Thanks. Right. So. Roughly speaking, here are the two clusters of sort of projects or interesting things going on in this vicinity. One is work on a conjectural DS CFT analogous to ADS CFT. Um, it, I think something like 20 years since DS CFT was proposed as maybe being a thing, and there hasn't been that much exciting uh, positive indicators since. But um, in any case, the, the project is generally to um, say that, look, we now have a, a positive cosmological constant, or we have good cause to get back to sort of the conversation with Chris and Molnigo. We have good cause to read off of cosmology that there's a fundamental constant that plays this role in our understanding of uh, the coupling of gravity and matter. If we make the leap and move from specifically to elliptic to sitter space time, then we have exactly one component in our conformal boundary. And so we don't need to deposit uh, mysterious harmonies between the past infinity conformal boundary and the future. We just have the one. And so if ever there's going to be a DSCFT, the, the thought goes, it would be EDS CFT rather than DS. But I, I should emphasize when these conversations progress, they do progress with the sort of operational style arguments that I flagged where equally so there are projects that do just posit sort of a mysterious harmony between future and past infinity. And maybe they, then try to justify, but I think this gets the order of justification backwards, but they, there's a sense that you can justify these sorts of harmonies in past and future infinity because we might just as well have been in elliptic to center space time where there was only one boundary anywhere or one component to the boundary. So that's one chunk of projects. The other is, I mentioned cosmological horizon complementarity. Um, so there are interesting relations here exactly because also in black hole complementarity, there are hopes to sort of tie that together with boundary bulk models. But, but there just the idea is um, if you restrict yourself to um, the sort of interior uh, of the uh, future cosmological horizon, uh, the thing that you're looking at has, if you forget about the boundary, the, the edge itself, what you're looking at is something that looks like uh, an FLRW sort of expanding uh, model. So it'd be a contracting model. Um, that looks uh, gesturally, it looks very much like the event horizon in. Uh, black holes. And so insofar as there's been movement to think about uh, a complementarity where you can just treat the maybe maybe a thin membrane ever so close but located in space-time, if you can treat that as encapsulating everything beyond, so too the hope is you can think about um, the cosmological horizon as capturing in de Sitter space-time everything beyond. The problem is the only way that 
that's going to be justified. But the only way you can hope that you can treat everything beyond the cosmological horizon as encoded is if you've essentially restricted yourself in the completely classical field theory on a background sense to elliptic to sitter spacetime. Uh, because in elliptic to sitter spacetime, all of space-time is exhausted by the interior and that horizon. Whereas in De Sitter space-time, you can, you know, futz about with, you know, perturbations on the vicinity of your spatial antipode, however much you want, and you'll just never see it. So I think in, that's another vein of research, there are connections, but it does proceed somewhat independently. And again, implicitly, they are helping themselves to the structure of EBS, uh, not just the structure of either or both or so on. Okay. I think that's kind of helpful. So, and I guess thinking about those models also then takes back, takes, ties in with what you were saying about what kind of motivates these sort of, uh, uh, they, um, these kind of suppositions or these kind of, this assumption of what the space-time, you know, vacuum state looks like, or empty space looks like, is that right? Because do they have act? So, is, are the speculations coming in at this level? Because it would be kind of nice if there's sort of there's some indications of these kind of duality, or is it kind of this looks like a nice math of representational framework? Let's see what we can get out of it. Or is there some quantum gravity in the background that suggests this would be a you know, physically reasonable picture. So I guess I'm now asking about the other part of the talk. So I, I, truth be told, I have a very poor sense of the gap between those two options in this part of the physics archive, or I mean, in this sort of part of the theoretical research. I think there's a lot of excitement built up around um, ADS-CFT now well beyond string theory. It's just sort of a, an ADS-CFT way of thinking about quantum gravity research. And in, in that broad frame, I think this fits in where conceivably it's a sort of positive argument that this fits into that program of research. You know, can we reduce the problem of quantum gravity to interesting properties of quantum field theories in lower dimensional boundary spaces? Now, how much is that a stable approach to quantum gravity that can supply those sorts of physical reasons? It's harder for me to say. I do think a lot of it does have the form of aspiration. Um, one important thing, a connection though, that I should flag is because elliptic to sitter space time is not time orientable. Um, you have to worry about spinners. And you have to tell a slightly more interesting story about certain kinds of quantum fields. Um, and so there is at least some relationship to, uh, the, the, I think the original, like the, the pull quote I used comes from a paper that's interested in CPT symmetry. And uh, in some ways that immediately gets problematized in a very theoretically appealing way if we're on in time non-orientable space. And so that might be a positive reason in the landscape of sort of cutting edge physics to want the time non-orientable empty space. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, John, you're, you're, you're next. Just for your information, we have five more minutes. Okay, I'll make it fairly quick. Uh, you've actually started to answer the question that I, that I had in, in talking to Nick. I'm just trying to figure out what changes when we go from uh, a decidus space-time to elliptical space-time in terms of field theory. Uh, you've talked about horizons, you've talked about parity, how do you define CPT when you've got a non-orientable uh, space? So I, you know, I've got much simpler questions. Uh, um, uh, can we foliate the space-time? Do we have spaces at, at an instant of now, such as, as you know, uh, um, um, axiomatic uh, in an FLRW space-time? 
Uh, is there some analog of the very simple propagations that we have in Dissida space-time? I'm assuming a Dissida space-time will have something like a, a plane wave propagating from uh, past time like infinity to future time like infinity when they get identified. Is there such a thing? What does it look like? Um, anything you can say just to give me more of a, a mental grip on what the transition looks like? Yeah, so um, this is a... a um, I can give you a fact, which is uh, a very unstable to perturbations kind of fact, but a, a fact nonetheless that um, in the sitter space time, signals never reach because of the horizon structure, signals never reach uh, their spatial antipode um, on this sort of hyperboloid sort of picture. Um, what this means is that when you move over, this is essentially why we end up with this equivalence class rather than isotropy sort of giving us the unique result, just like in the Minkowski case. Um, the result is that you can think of field theories like scalar field theories in elliptic to space spacetime as one to one with the field configurations on to space spacetime that are characterized by antipodally symmetric initial data. Um, so that, that includes sort of a, you know, a wave pulse propagating from past to future. That being said, I say this is a fragile result. Um, if the null generic condition is violated by a little perturbation in that initial data, then, um, so for, for, for many physically reasonable scenarios that we'd be uh, caring about in the neighborhood or vicinity of these field theoretic solutions, um, you do get propagation all the way to the spatial antipode in finite time. Um, and so uh, you need to be careful about how you state the sort of strength of that relationship between field theories in the elliptic setting and a subclass of configurations in the Desider set. Um, I should also say that the identification of past and future infinity is still at infinity. So there are no closed time like curves or anything um, in elliptic. And the foliation? Uh, so you can, I mean, you don't get a foliation in the sense that it's not going to be globally hyperbolic, um, but you can, by essentially along the same lines as I was just sketching, there's a sense of a generalized Cauchy surface that you can define that you sort of index to the way we think of foliations in De Sitter space time. Um, and so this would be in the Penrose diagram, if you forget that past and future infinity are identified with a twist, you do still have the line that looks kind of like a Cauchy surface, but of course it's not gonna be a Cauchy surface if past and future are identified. Um, but but it's, so, so it's a generalization of the kind of foliation you might have wanted. It's space like. So nice. Yeah. Sorry. David, you have a little bit of time, but by a little bit of time. Go for it. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. David, we can't hear you. Okay, sorry. It was a separate thought about just what um what empty space means in the in the particle physics context. I mean here's here's a thought. I mean part there's a there was at least one reading of what you're saying where it's something like you know this this, this is going to be the the, the, the space-time background on which the vacuum state of the relevant quantum field theory is going to be defined and, and set up and i'm a bit worried about in the center model i'm worried about spontaneous symmetry breaking so i've got a you know um uh you know I, I've, I've got a chiral condensate present from spontaneously breaking the chiral u1 in the, in the strong sector and i've got a, a higgs condensate present from spontaneously breaking uh, SU2 cross U1 in the electroweak sector. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if this particularly matters or, or not. I'm sort of unsure, just unsure how to fit it into your framework. There's, just a, there's a fairly important sense in which even absent gravity and even absent particles, um, the vacuum state of the standard model is, is, not, is not at all empty. It's full of condensates. You could just say whether that's how that plugs into the project. Yeah, so I don't have... I think anything particularly intelligent to say beyond what I suspect you can guess I might say, which is um, we're, we're butting up 
exactly at the sort of gap between um, our vacuum concept that we're comfortable with in sort of quantum field theory standard model, especially particle context. And what we mean by vacuum in the wake of general relativity. Um, and I think, I think you're, you're right to note that one way of stating an aspect of the project is, well, in the wake of general relativity, are we taking the cosmological constant to license a change in our understanding of the symmetries of the vacuum state? Uh, pertinent for even local analyses in the particle physics case. I don't, I don't have the punchline to that. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm very perplexed what to think about that. And I, I just think this is one way of getting at precisely that hairy intersection in a, I think, different way than it's been articulated. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Mike, and thank you to all of you for uh, joining us today. It's been quite a nice uh, Q&A and great talk. We will see you next week for the last uh, lecture of this semester, and uh, meanwhile, have a great week. Bye. Thanks again, Mike.